Good morning. This is Kim Sunshine with the Kim Sunshine Show, and I have an awesome guest here today, and it is Vincent Lyon with Lyon Law. Good morning, Kim. Thanks for having me. Glad of to be course, here. of course. Well, tell us about now the law that you're doing. So you you work in have worked in a variety of areas of law, but your focus today is or the, at this season. Right. So I yeah I did uh, what they used to call door law, which is anything that comes in the door. Um, <laughs> yeah, I used to do that kind of real estate too. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. did that uh, till I could sort of figure where I was uh, most comfortable and most uh, enjoyed doing my job. Um, you don't want to do a job you're not enjoying if you can if you can avoid it. So um, I actually have focused my practice on probates and guardianships. Um, I like to help people who are um, typically for Florida, that means people who are uh, nearing the end of their life or mm -hmm. who have just lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. So we need people to do that and help out. So who who would be a person that would be a good client of yours? Is it the the person themselves, obviously the children, or when should should people talk to you about that type of situation? Well, when should people talk to me about it is um, before anything happens. Uh, that's that's always the whole thing. Get, <laughs> Prevention get is the best medicine. Right. Have a plan in place. Um, the biggest mistake in estate planning that people make is not having a plan at all. Um, but and by a plan, I mean not just having a will, but having a power of attorney, a healthcare surrogate, a living will. Um, those documents are a basic package of of uh, estate planning mm -hmm. and the will deals with what happens to your property after you die but those other documents deal with what happens uh, when you can't make uh, certain decisions for yourself when you are uh, sick or have lost some ability uh, who's going to make those decisions for you take care of your finances take care of your medical decisions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those are in those planning documents if you have those in place it makes everything so much smoother um, the other thing aside of it, of course, is if you reach a point, as a lot of people do nowadays when they get older, um, dementia is an issue that a lot of people mm -hmm. have. And so as far as the first question, who's the ideal client, uh, it is the child of somebody who, who's um, who's having uh, capacity issues, okay. it's, uh, starting to lose memory, starting to lose their ability to handle themselves. And uh, they need to talk to an attorney about possibly getting the legal right to um, – make those decisions for them. If they don't have that in place, mm -hmm. um, the power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate, then they're going to need at some point a guardian. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, sometimes we think uh, we hit a certain age and the doctors always tell us, get this checked at this age or like every time it's mother's day, check your fire, um, your fire, did your smoke detectors, detectors in your house. So there's certain things that we, we think of on a calendar. So if, if we were to say, when's a good time to check? Well, I have all my senses and, and maybe I want to prepare for myself when I get to that age. When's a good time for me to do a check on that? Um, I don't think that it's something that's based on age as what I'll always tell people is um, an estate plan should be in place when something major changes in your life. When you get married, when you have children, when you get divorced, uh, when you move to another state. Uh, these are major life events, and every time you go through something that's a major life event, you should check to make sure your plans are in place. When you buy a house? Buying a house can certainly be a major event. Um, what about buying a boat? Because I know for, for some people, like <laughs> that is like the biggest thing. Is like, yay, I bought a boat. Like, Is that a good time to... Um, well, I it. would I would want to make sure <laughs> that a boat is in your estate plan. Okay, um, is because it covered in your will? Is it is you know and and you know depending on what you do with the vote, boat and uh, how much it is, maybe you do want to change who your power of attorney is. Actually, in buying a boat, you will depending on the size of the boat, you might very well have to hire have to get a power of attorney. Uh, what's called a limited power of attorney. Mm -hmm. that's, you see these in doing real estate all the time mm -hmm. where somebody can sign the real estate documents for someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, boats are the same. I had a client who bought a boat, had to go down to Miami to get it. So they had to get a power of attorney to someone to receive the boat when it was delivered. Oh, wow. Miami. Okay. Very Not that cool. You're talking to a multi-million dollar yacht in that case, but, um, but you know, it doesn't have to be that big. Uh, if you're buying the, you know, trawler from the neighbor when he's uh, downsizing 
maybe you don't need that quite that much, <laughs> but uh, certainly it, it's it's an individual decision. Okay. Um, but, but you yeah. handle that. You'll, you would handle that if somebody were to have to do a temporary power of attorney or a limited power of attorney all the way up to including the boat into an estate. Now, does that mean that the estate gets to pay for the repairs and upgrades on the boat? <laughs> <laughs> well, you only pay for what you own in the estate. Estate doesn't technically exist until <laughs> someone dies. Um, I'm just teasing because that's one of the things that I uh, – boat stands for bust out another thousand – to uh, help keep it going and and the way that running the way that you want. My my favorite is that a boat is a hole in the water you pour your money into. Ah, uh, but it's so <laughs> much fun. You know, that's the whole thing. We were out um on the intercoastal down at Waterfront Park with with my church doing a little prayer thing and just watching everybody go by on the boats and um seeing how much fun everybody was having. It just made me smile. I mean, it just brought a lot of joy to me just to see how much fun and and how happy the people were on the boats. So. Because I was thinking that's a winner. They won at life. They that probably was a big plan and a big goal to get that boat and to be on this water today. And I just it just made me smile, made me happy. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of re a reason. A lot of people are here. My father in law moved to Palm Coast and bought in the C section so that he could have a boat in his backyard, basically, and sit and take it out to the. Uh, out to the ocean. Well, I'll tell you, you're getting more value out of your boat if you get to look at it every day in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, well, he came <laughs> down nice from dock, he yeah. came down from DC, and so he got tired of paying the uh, you know the, the fees for Storage. the for the yeah you know, where do they call it? I'm blanking on where you keep marina marina <laughs> paying the marina fees, having to travel 30 minutes to get to his boat to take it out. He didn't want any of that. He came to a beautiful Palm Coast so that he could have a canal and a boat right there. Um, so where would he go boating up in D.C. on the Potomac? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I lived in that area for a minute and um, loved it up there. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing that compares to Florida and the area that we're at. But it draws a lot of people here to retire. And that's you know, kind of what's keeping me going with the uh, probate and guardianship work. I think the biggest thing up in D.C., like um, I, I was kind of excited that, hey, there's that Route 66, like you get your kicks on Route 66. But the um, traffic, it was not you get your kicks on Route 66. It's like you get to listen to all of your favorite songs while you're waiting for the traffic on Route 66 yeah. to get out to uh, Northern Virginia. But, yeah, I, that was I a went, good time. <laughs> I went to law school at George Washington in D.C. And uh, I was working while I was in school. I was working for a firm um, on one side of the Beltway. But as a student, you know, your time schedules are different. When I graduated, he wanted me to work, come work for him full time, and he said, "What could I do to to uh, <laughs> uh, get you to work for me?" And I said, "Open an office where I am, because I'm not taking that commute around the Beltway every day." <laughs> it is a long one. So you were a driver. So now, one of the cool things about the D.C. area is the public transportation is unbelievable. Like you can get anywhere, and the train system uh, is it goes out. It reaches pretty far out into the community, which is is yeah. very very interesting. So yeah, see, because we don't have any public transportation at all here. We no buses or trains or anything here in Central Florida. No, I, I lived in D.C. I've also lived in Boston, which has an excellent T system. Um, both of those were great. Uh, when I was in Boston, I sold my car. I didn't need to have a car at all. You didn't all. even need a car? How no. cool is that? So did um, you live down in the city in one of the flats? or like? A, I lived in a brownstone in, in Boston. In a brownstone. Down, yeah, uh, on wow. the Back Bay area of Boston. How cool uh, is that? Actually in Boston. and. Walked to the grocery store, the tops, um, and uh, when I would have to go over to Cambridge, mm -hmm. crossing that uh, Charles River, um, it was faster to walk it than to take a bus because really? the traffic, again, we're back to the bad traffic. Bad in the traffic. <laughs> well, I'm so thankful for our area and our lack of, um, and our, our leisurely traffic. Uh, I know that I usually leave my house at 8.30, but it was funny. The one day I was driving after a meeting at like 10 o'clock, and I'm like, oh, wow, the traffic is different at 10 o'clock. There's more cars on the road, but none of it is awful. Like <laughs> in the big cities, we still have the luxury of yeah. really very little traffic. For those of us who've lived in the big cities, and I also lived not not in, but in between LA and San Diego, so I've driven in LA traffic. Oh, Southern California! So Look at you, Mister Worldly. Over, <laughs> but uh, all over the United States, uh, not Me worldly, too. just America. <laughs> National. But, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, there's, we come here and and we hear people talk about the traffic, <laughs> and you just kind of roll your eyes a little bit because it's 
actually sat for you know an hour and a half to three hours in uh, ten lanes of traffic, like in L.A. Hey, you know, you this is a this is a breeze. There are lighter places though. Um, my family, I'm from Oklahoma originally, and Oklahoma. I go back to Oklahoma sometimes, and it's just a cornfields a lot of cornfields right <laughs> a lot of cornfields so the big scare in oklahoma for, well from a show that i saw maybe it's not it, i like documentaries and news but there was one where the cornfields were high at a railroad crossing and the they couldn't see that there was a train coming and there was no indication and that's when the the dividers or the stops had to be put everywhere not just at major intersections because there was a time when that only had to be done at major intersections to stop people from crossing the railroad tracks but there had to be some indicator or something put at all the roads i don't know if it's true or not and it oh, might not even have been oklahoma but i just remember the corn and, that, and i know oklahoma is beautiful and grows a lot of our corn here in america correct it does yeah mm -hmm. that's uh corn is, is i didn't do it but a lot of people i know would go out at, at shucking season and get you know part-time work uh Chucking corn, pulling, picking the corn, um, mm -hmm. and fresh corn feels fully ripe right off the plant. The, the best way to have corn is to pull it off the plant and drop it in the pot right there. Right there. Um, oh, how nice. So that's how you do it. Just boil that. Your, so do you? Yeah. Ha are there a lot of different recipes for corn? There are a lot of different recipes for corn, but I'm always just partial to com on the cob. So I want to let you know the biggest trending thing right now on, on TikTok is it's it's corn. It's corn. There's a little boy talking about the his corn boy, about yeah. the corn boy, right? Corn boy. <laughs> so, um, so my Paulo and I would always have a discussion on what's the best way to make corn because I would like to boil it with a few pieces of the husk and that puts the natural sweetness in. Because I've gone through the thing of hey, put milk in there and sugar and all, no, yes, 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 all yeah. kinds of things. But I find that a few pieces of the husk actually bring out the sweetness in the corn, and he liked it grilled like. Oh, and it was oh, delicious sure. both ways. And I just, I love all different things. Well, the f with corn, the freshest it is, the sweeter it is. Um, the fresher it is, the sweeter yeah. it is. And you just pull the outer leaves off and drop it in the pot. And uh, yeah, we don't worry about the silk? strings and stuff. The silk, they'll come off. Well, you, you cut the end off. Yes. Most of the silk. And that'll yeah. get most of it off. Well, the silks actually bring the sweetness. So I was ta taught that the silks and a few strands of the inner part of the husk if you boil that in, it it brings adds sweetness. I don't know. You're an expert. Try I'm it out. An expert. See what I don't you know. Think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to think. I have one more question for you. I forgot. Um, okay, so for people who are just moving here to the area by the ocean, and I know you love animals and you love you love pets, so I'm asking everybody this: If you were to advise somebody who's never been stung by a jellyfish, how would you tell them to handle the jellyfish sting? Um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> wash it uh that's that's the really the thing is uh it was i think it's cold water is the best uh you know to get the sting but i've never been stung <laughs> i haven't either i don't want to some of the answers i'm getting are pretty funny <laughs> i know there's an old wives tale about uh, uh you know peeing on it basically but uh that's it's I, well, I would try it like if i was stung, i would definitely say try well, it make it stop stinging my guess is like i said it's best to wash it out with cool water mm -hmm. my guess is urinating on it is better than salt water oh I think yeah that's probably why if you're on the beach and the only water you have is the ocean maybe it's a better choice <laughs> exactly exactly so there was a friends episode and uh as i asked a question from somebody they're like you got to see that friends episode so i looked it up on youtube and the amount of pain that it appears that is <laughs> inflicted with a jellyfish sting i've never been stung by one i have seen them on the ocean when i'm walking by the beach so i just don't disturb them but oh my gosh, yes, I would like pee on it. I would say I would be like, do something and make this pain stop because the amount of pain that it appeared to inflict was not looking good. Yeah, again, I haven't been stung. I don't hope to ever be stung. Um, and uh, it's going to vary by which jelly it is. There are so many out there, but uh, they're beautiful, beautiful creatures. They are. So one of my one of my clients. Um, Courtney with uh, with Carpet One actually came in and told me that the jellyfish was her her motto animal because when she had cancer and lost her hair and this was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard that she had lost her hair that she had to learn to shine from within like a jellyfish and she was very transparent and I said well I think it was transparency that was big for you but she it was just so beautiful the way that she said that that she overcame cancer 
And during that time, she held on to the jellyfish <laughs> that that shines from within, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, they are very beautiful, and they are in our waters. I mean, I've seen jellies in the canals uh, in the sea section of Palm Coast. Um, you know, probably not the stinging kind. Right. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've seen jellyfish in there, and, and uh, in any of the salt water, they're the – I try to say jelly because – fish but uh, we all know them as jellyfish mm -hmm. we know them as starfish they're not really fish either right <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly well i'm going to thank you so much for spending some time here with me today mr vincent lyon and he is available if you are interested in learning more about probates or state planning guardianship he is your man and he's available to answer any questions that you have he's been doing this for a long time how many years have you been working in this section of law in this area of law, um, first time I've gone into it, I can look that up, but it's um, probably five years in this whole area. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a safe, <laughs> safe in total, number to guess, maybe total more. amount of time? Um, I've been a lawyer since 05, so 17 years. 17 years, and how time flies. And you've done litigation, so you've done the whole yes. gamut, the, the open door, the door law. Door law. <laughs> door yeah, law. Yeah. So he um, has a lot of experience in all different areas, and any of that experience from other areas, when you're in a specialty such as law, it, it helps you. It, each one of those things that, that you have walked through helps you, even if it's not the exact thing, but you understand the process and how it all works. Yes. Uh, I think it's good to get a lawyer who um, – spends most of their time in a particular field for that issue you need. Um, a generalist, often they're not going to be as uh, good at, at certain things. Um, as far as litigation, I mean, I certainly have done probate litigations where family members fight. Uh, it's, it's never fun when families don't get along. And usually when someone passes, that's when all the, you know, all, all, Yes. Hell breaks loose. Yes. All the cabinets open. Yeah. Everything's um, exposed that's been hidden for years. That's one of the things that I always pray. And I notice that, um, you know, as you get older, you see things and your eyes are open. And that's one of the things that I notice that if somebody passes away, the, the, the friction and animosity that can be caused or the just the stirring and contention that can be caused in the within the family unit itself. And that's my prayer is always for peace for the family and peace for everybody surrounding them. And especially if the person that I know that they're able to walk through the whole thing with peace because we can't really control other people, but we have to find our own peace um, when walking through a challenging situation such as the loss of a loved one. That's a good frame of mind being I can't change other people. I can only change how I react to other people. Yes, and React isn't even, if I can take that a step further, <laughs> if I may, um, one of the things that, that I was taught is the difference between reacting and responding. Now, you have to imagine, uh, my ex-husband's from New York, so there's a, you know, New York's a little more animated than um, Southern Bells, and I'm, not that I was in Southern Bell by any means, but boy, I sure would like to be, and, um, but New Yorkers are a little bit more animated, and I had to learn how to take a step back not react but to respond to situations and i think lawyers might have that naturally like you guys are taught to hey don't get emotions involved and um and politicians are definitely you know they definitely just respond to things they don't even let anything move them and carefully think everything out but me i was never trained about that so i was like blah, 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 and i'm pretty opinionated so um so i had to learn to respond rather than react and i'll tell you that has helped me so much in life and the, the visual that I got was a nuclear reactor. Like if something upsets you or hits your heartstrings or gets your emotions going and you get like a nuclear reactor, that's never good. Like, <laughs> so it's much better to take that time, take a few minutes, think everything clearly through and then just respond. So that, that was from me from being a child to an adult. I mean, in my mind. And I think I was probably 35 when I figured that out. <laughs> Sounds about right. You really don't become adult until you're mid thirties. <laughs> exactly right, because you have to learn a few things. Because we think we know everything when we're teenagers. I mean, I knew everything. Did you? I didn't know everything, but I was pretty. Oh. But what I knew, I knew. <laughs> I knew that I knew that I knew. <laughs> then I was in my thirties, and I was like, I don't know anything. Like I have to learn a lot. I have a lot to learn, and uh, the quest for knowledge has been on ever since. <laughs> 
never <laughs> stop learning. Exactly, exactly. And one of the other things that you were telling me earlier, I just want to touch on this for a brief minute, that you are very well versed in 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 literature, in American literature, oh. and so I've so tell me. Yeah. Well, tell me, tell me what, tell me a little bit about that, and what would you would do to encourage someone to read. Um, well, it depends on who you're trying to encourage. Uh, mm -hmm. I was encouraged to read by being read to by my parents. Mm -hmm. I still have very fond memories of some of my earliest memories. Um, my mother reading to me um, the auto the biography of Alfred of um, I'm sorry blank um, Wild Bill Hickok. Mm -hmm. So I remember my mom reading that to me when I was a little little kid. I remember when I was in kindergarten and everybody was struggling with the c mat run books mm -hmm. so dull because i was already on to adult books by the time i got to kindergarten right um not an adult you know because you're <laughs> well you're more mature up, books yes books, yeah. mm -hmm. probably you know young adult fic young adult literature um, mm -hmm. for what it was i was reading encyclopedia brown i guess in kindergarten oh do you remember how cool <laughs> it was to just like like randomly open up an encyclopedia and like fig learn something new Oh yeah, I love that. We had the Encyclopedia Britannica in my house. Um, taking it, I joked, but it's not. It's only half a joke that um, used books in my house for insulation because every wall had bookcases. So, <laughs> well, what books, a great insulation! <laughs> yes, having, having books in the house, um, which is kind of funny because now I almost don't like to read books. I, I like to read on my. Kindle e-reader. Really? I really prefer to read on oh. the electronic form. Really? Which is strange to me because I so grew strange. up taking, you know, writing notes in the on the paper and being able to fold the corner down. I know some people will hate that. But oh my my book, I can do what I want with it. Uh, I love the feel of books. I love the smell of books. Now, I yeah. don't have the passion for reading like you do, though. So you have a huge passion. I'm sure you've run probably a thousand times more books than me. But when I have a book, I like to feel the pages and touch it and turn it and leave it near me. And I just I like a book. There's there's something about that. Uh, this is actually a, a project that, that I am peripherally connected to. There's an organization that provides dictionaries to school children, mm -hmm. to, to grade school children. And um, the Rotary Club that I'm in uh, coordinates for them for this uh, for the local school district. So Rotary Club helps nice. distribute these dictionaries and Very we've nice. talked about that you know hey everything's going electronic right um and we talked to the our our representative ken you know, talked to the students at the, or talked to the representative of the school system said you know if everybody's going electronic the kids are getting you know tablets and, and laptops do they need a paper dictionary book and they said absolutely yes. one of the reasons is and not the only reason but one of the reasons is Kids love to hold it and have mm -hmm. something that's theirs because right. it's not given to the school. It's given to the kid. Oh, nice. So they get to have their own book, and they can do what they want with their book, and it's their book. And the other is, of course, the school does teach how to uh, use material resource research. Um, as a lawyer, everything I do for research is online. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went to law school, they said, yeah, everything's online, but you're still going to learn to do the books because you never know when you're going to be stuck in a – a backwoods area that doesn't, you know, the internet's down or something. Yep. You can walk into a law library and know how to pull the right books off the shelf. Is it like a card catalog? <laughs> 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 like we had. So I think one of the reasons why I like a physical book is um, to be able to remember things. And I kind of get a little snapshot picture. I wouldn't say I have a photographic memory, but I have, a, I, I, maybe I have a Polaroid <laughs> memory but that feeling so i maybe the book having a different texture a different feel a different thickness a different weight is getting in a, a second sense so i'm able to remember that a little bit more so maybe true photographic memory might just only need one sense to be stimulated to remember but i think that the book because I, I can see a book i can see the words of the page with a physical book i can't see it as easily with digital and right. it might be because I'm always on the holding the digital, so that's nothing new to make a different impression. Like I'm all like I'm, I use my phone a lot, so I'm always holding my phone. So that weight is very natural, normal. It's not anything different. But if I'm holding a book, that book weighs different, feels different, smells different, and then I can see the picture, and all of those things are brought back to my memory when I try to remember what's inside the book. There, there are pluses and minuses to both, but yeah, reading a book does have a different and a physical printed. Uh, page does have a different feel and a different way and your eyes react differently to it i mean you're not having a light in your eyes um 
you know, the blue screen or the screen on your phone, if there's mm -hmm. a white background, black text, that's it's straining on the eyes more so than looking at a piece of paper. Right. Um, but then there are other advantages the other way. Like what I like about my Kindle is if I don't know a word, I just tap it and it brings up a definition. Oh, of it. that's <laughs> what it, oh my gosh, what a wonderful thing. Cause I always stop. If I see a word that I don't know, I always stop and look it up. And it's just so important to me, even if I can make it out in the sentence and then I'm like, okay, I believe this is what it means. And then I check myself to see if I was right on my assumed definition based on the context that it was used in. I love that. So the other cool thing about digital is you can have it read to you. So you, you turn it into audible, but then you can have your, um, my phone will read even if it's not meant to be an audible book. Right. So, uh, so that's another bonus, but we are getting the sign that the time is up. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh my gosh. We could talk for my hours. Pleasure. Oh, it's always fun being with you, Kim. I have, uh, you know, I, I learned so much new about you every time that we get a chance to meet. So we're going to dig into more stories and more things in the future with Vincent Lyon as we're live here and in person with Vincent Lyon. He's pretty remarkable. And we're so thankful to have you here in Flagler County and that you are a resource for the customers and clients that you're serving. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. And I appreciate you being here and having this service. This, this, this organization is wonderful for businesses that are trying to really um, connect to each other. And, and just, I think one of the greatest things about places like this is the way you feel like you're not just not alone struggling with a business. You are part of a community, even if it's, you know, not even thinking of it as a way of, of thriving as a business, but just thinking of it as, you are part of something bigger, and that's always a good thing. Uh, well, we are so thankful because you were one of the first people that joined us as we were trying to figure, just still figuring out what are we going to do and what are we, what resources are we going to bring to the community. And um, I thank you for that, and I appreciate it, Vincent. And thank you for your compliments. I You're welcome. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great day, and I hope that everything that you have in your mind and your desires is coming true for you today, tomorrow, and every day.